John's Gospel is one of my favorite places to read about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And the reason it is, is is because we get all of this extra information, extra teaching in John's Gospel that we don't get in the others. In between the, the Last Supper and the arrest of Jesus, we have this we have this, this several chapters long section of John's gospel where Jesus is teaching his disciples when they go to Gethsemane to pray, we get the content of Jesus' prayers. And the passage that we are going to read tonight as we are uh, continuing in our series through the I Am sayings of Jesus in John's gospel happens right in this section. Jesus has been explaining to his disciples that the time has come for him to die, that the time has come where he is going to leave them. That's the way he puts it in, in our passage. And sometimes it's, it's hard for me to imagine. imagine. Imagine being one of Jesus' closest disciples, James or John or Peter or Thomas or Mary Magdalene or, or, or something like that. You have followed him around from place to place for two or three years. You've gone everywhere with him. You have hung on every word that he said. You have traveled throughout the countryside telling other people about him. You have adopted him as your teacher, your rabbi, your master that you want to learn at his feet. And then he tells you that he's leaving. That the next thing that has to happen is that he's going to go away. And the way that the religious authorities have been conspiring against him, the way that the temperature has been turned up in Jerusalem over the last week, you're pretty sure that that means that he's going to die soon. In fact, he's even said as much to you. How might that make you feel? I expect that Jesus knew the answer to that question fairly well. It's why he starts the passage tonight telling his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And Jesus, even though he's about to face his darkest hour, even though He's in the moment where, where, where perhaps the most appropriate thing would be for his disciples to take their turn to comfort and strengthen him. Jesus, once again, takes it upon himself to teach and to comfort his disciples. So that's where we read tonight. It's in John chapter 14. We're going to read the first seven verses. John 14, 1 to 7. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, for those of us who have grown up in the faith, these are words that we've heard spoken many times. Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they sound beautiful, and yet I I confess, often I had, well, 
that, that, that I have not often spent time contemplating, meditating on what these wondrous words might really mean. And so we pray that you will open up your word to us tonight. Spirit, make it plain, make it clear. Teach us so that we have an even deeper love an even deeper knowledge and appreciation of who Jesus Christ is, what it means that we are counted as his, what it means that we follow after him as his disciples. So Spirit, help us to hear, to understand, and to believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to be leaving them. In the first few verses, he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to take you to myself. So the... The first thing that Jesus says to his disciples is that he's, he's going to prepare a place for them. He says he's leaving, that he's going to go and prepare a dwelling place for them, and that they will follow him and then come to be with him where he is. He's talking about his father's dwelling place. He's talking about heaven. He's telling them that he's going to die And that after his death and resurrection, he will leave them again. He will go to be with his father. He will prepare a place for them. And that in due time, they will come to be with him where he is. He says that he will will come to bring them to be where he is with him. This is, in reading this passage, I I often sort of, uh, gallop past this part to get to the what seems like the meaty stuff anyway where he talks about being the way the truth and life we're, we're going to get there in just a second but but consider consider the incredible truth of what Jesus says to his disciples here not just to the 12 but to each and every one of us who believes in Jesus he says and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Have you ever thought about this before? That Jesus wants you to be with him. That what Jesus wants for all of eternity is for you to be with him. That he has the entire rest of eternity in front of him and in front of of us. And what he wants is for you to be with him. You know, we all know, we all know that Jesus loves us, right? We sing about it as a child, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We know that Jesus loves us because He went to the cross to offer his life as a sacrifice for sinners like us. But I expect, I expect that that deep down in our most sort of negative self-talk, in our worst moments and in the darker places of our hearts, we expect that Jesus loves us because he's supposed to, because his father told him to, but that he doesn't really like us. That he'd be happy to redeem us and then spend eternity on his own. See what Jesus says here. He wants to be with you. He wants you to be with him for all of eternity. And Jesus tells his disciples that they know the way to where he is going. That when the time comes for them to join him, they will know the way. But Thomas pipes up and says, what I expect more than one of us is thinking, and more than one of them was thinking as well. And he says, we don't know where you're going. 
So how can we know the way? And it's to that question. You don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? It's in response to that question that Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So let's talk about those three I am sayings that Jesus gives to us here. I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. In this instance, they all go together. They all work together. And Thomas's question was about the way to where Jesus is going. He says, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. And so the way is sort of the, is sort of the lead principle in Jesus' statement here, the lead principle in his response. Because I, I am the way is the clearest response to, to the question that Thomas asks. And so the other two, I am the truth and I am the life, are going to help us understand what it is that Jesus means when he says, I am the way. So we're, we're going to take the way last and we're going to talk about the other two first. So let's, let's start with, I am the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. Jesus claims to be the final and fullest revelation of God's truth. All of the prophets who came before him, all of the true prophets that God called to speak on his behalf, they spoke the truth. They declared things that were true. God gave them words to say, and they repeated them. Those those prophets had the truth, and sometimes they spoke the truth, but they themselves weren't the truth. They were all sinners. They were all in need of redemption, just like the rest of us are. But Jesus says, I am the truth. He is the final and fullest revelation of God's truth. Throughout John's gospel, there's this, there's this, this, this principle of the word. He starts his gospel saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That there is this truth, this body of knowledge, this revelation about who God is and what he says and he does. And he communicates this truth to us by speaking and acting in history. God reveals himself through what he says and what he does. And so the word of God is communicated to us by his spoken words and by his actions throughout all of time. That word is, is recorded for us in the scriptures. We know what God has done from the time of Adam all the way up to Jesus and afterwards because he's given it to us in his word. In them he speaks and his words and his actions are communicated to us. But in Jesus Christ, the word put on flesh. Before Jesus, we had, we had various prophets simply telling us the truth. When Jesus arrives, he is the truth. That there are not simply moments where God gives Jesus something true to say, which is what all of the other prophets did. But with Jesus Christ, every single moment, every single action, every single word, every single act of service, every miracle, everything that Jesus does is the truth. Jesus is the truth of all things with skin on, the truth of God in human form. Jesus is the truth. This is one of the things that undergirds Jesus calling himself the way. The second is that he calls himself the life. He says, I am the life. God is life. God always has been. There was never a time when God did not exist, and there was never a time where God came to life. He always has been. And then he spoke the world into existence, and he breathed the breath of life into every living thing. Every animal and every human being that draws breath in this world 
has life because that life has been derived from the true and eternal source of all life, God himself. We only have life because it is given to us. When you were formed in your mother's womb, there was a time when you were not. And then you were because God gave you life. But Jesus never received life. Jesus was never given life. He always was and he always is. Jesus doesn't possess a life that began at some point and then later ends. Rather, he is the life of God himself. He is the life, the one life that has always existed. The one life from whom all other lives receive their their power, their liveliness. So Jesus is God himself with flesh on. He's the truth of God as a man. And his life is the eternal life of God. It had no beginning. So with all of this being true, in answer to Thomas saying, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, Thomas says, we don't know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus is, and this is precisely what Jesus says here, Jesus is the only way to God the Father. This is incredibly exclusive what Jesus says here. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way to the prepared abode of heaven. He is the only way to see and to know God. Jesus even says, if you know me, you know my Father also. So from now on, you know him And have seen him. The only way to go to God. Is Jesus Christ. And the only way to know God. Is Jesus Christ. The only way. For men to know the God who is there. Is to know the man who embodies the truth of God. And the life of God. There is no true knowledge of God apart from him. This means at least a couple of things, okay? First, what we've been saying, that there is no true communion with God apart from Jesus. There is no true knowledge of God apart from Jesus. If you reject Jesus as the Son of God, you do not know God. There is no back door. There is no second way. We all like to imagine that we can construct our own system of beliefs, our own, our own morality, our own ideas about what God likes or doesn't like, and that this, this spirituality that we create, no matter, no matter how we put it together, that somehow it will bring us closer to God, that no matter what we believe or how we do it, so long as we put our own, our own efforts into concocting our spirituality, that somehow it will bring us closer to the, to the cosmic presence or cosmic goodness that is, that is God, if there's any God there. But, but Jesus simply won't have any of that. There is no creating our own way to God. Any spirituality that sees Jesus as unimportant or that merely sees him as one way among many to know God is not true or living there is no knowledge of or communion with God apart from Jesus Christ no one comes to the father except through him so if you've been well if you've been thinking of Jesus as one way among many as one as one flavor of the many ways that God relates to 
God relates to his creation. Perhaps you get, you get something of him through Jesus, but you also get something of him through Judaism and something of him through Islam and something of him through Hinduism and something of him through your own personal spiritual experiences. It's just not the way that it works. There is, there is one way to know the God who is there, the true and living God, and it is Jesus Christ and only him. And what's great about Jesus is, well, is the second thing we're going to say here is that if you want to know what God is like, if you want to know the God who is there, if you want to come to understand him more intimately, more deeply, if you want to grow in your knowledge of him and become more like him, what he does and what he says and what he cares about, you can know these things intimately through Jesus Christ. He is not just a, a list of character traits or of laws, though he is his attributes and and his laws do teach us about him, but if you want to know what, what God looks like, acts like, speaks like as a person, you have that in Jesus Christ. To read and know and hear and see Jesus is to know and hear and read and see God the Father, is to know God himself. So what? So why does, this, why does this matter for us? How does this speak into our lives right now? A couple of things. Maybe you struggle to believe that you are worthy of love. We're going to circle back to something I said earlier. Maybe you struggle to believe that anyone likes you or that there's anything particularly likable about you. Hear what Jesus says about preparing a place for you and coming, you, coming to bring you to be with him. You know the, I assume most of you have played the game Desert Island before, where you have to pick like books or movies or something like that or music that you would bring with you to a desert island if you were on your own for the rest of your life. These would be the things that you are reading and watching and listening to for the rest of your life. You've heard this game before, yes? Okay. Blank stares. It's very hot. Um, have you ever played it? Have you ever played it with... People. I've heard, I've heard this done before too. We say, okay, if I, if I had to spend the rest of my life on a deserted island with just one person for the rest of my life, who, who would I want it to be? And Jesus' answer to this, and we're not going to push the analogy too far because heaven is not the same as a desert island, but Jesus' answer to this is all of you. All of his people, everyone who belongs to him, all of us together, and each of you individually, know that the Lord of the, of the universe loves you and likes you this way. That it is his desire that eternity be spent with you in his presence and with him in yours. It's really a beautiful thing that he loves you and wants to see your face every day and you see his for the rest of eternity. He delights in you. He loves you. Or maybe, maybe God is feeling far away from you and like you're not, you're not connected to his life. Jesus tells us that he is the life of God. Feeling, are you, are you feeling lost and aimless in your, your Bible reading and your prayers? Or maybe, maybe you've sort of given up on them altogether. Start, if I can make a suggestion to you, start back up at the clearest place to know God. Jesus Christ. Start reading one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, even John that we've been spending this time in for the last several weeks. 
if you want to do it, if this, if this is something you want to do, you want to spend the next, you want to spend the next month or, or whatever reading through, reading through one of the Gospels and talking about it a little bit, let's do it. I'll, I'll read it with you. Talk to me. We'll make a plan and we'll touch base every week. We'll read about Jesus and we'll talk about him because he is, he is the way. He is how we are connected to the God who is there, the true and living God. He is how you come to know that God better because he is him. And when he acts and when he speaks, he is acting and speaking as God in the flesh. It is always worth it to know Jesus. He is the way to God. He is the truth of God. He is the life of God, living, breathing, speaking, sleeping, eating, drinking, dying, and rising. God himself. To know him is to know the true and living God because Jesus is the way and the only way to know him. Let's pray. Father, help us to embrace from our hearts Jesus Christ, the only way to you, to look to him for the truth, to find our connection to the life of God, the eternal life of God in him, being united to him and sharing in that abundant and everlasting life. So we pray today and always, set our hearts on Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.